Matt, thank you so much for, should we say, inviting me to your house. And I appreciate you are a busy, busy man with lots going on. Thanks but for if, inviting me. <laughs> but if anyone doesn't know who you are, then can you introduce yourself and just tell us who you are? I'm Matt Webley. Um, I've been selling online for about over 20 years now. Literally how I've made my money since leaving university. I dropped out of university, started making money online, bought a nightclub with some of the money I made online and ended up going full circle and back into making primarily my money online. And I thought, what I did do is I dipped my toes in the world of Amazon because when I first started Amazon really wasn't a, a thing you could sell on it wasn't a marketplace and then when I came back into it from the nightclub world it was something so I started exploring it did a bit of private label did a bit of retail arbitrage did a bit of online arbitrage and eventually ended up creating some software for sellers doing online arbitrage one of the tools you might have heard of is Buybot Pro another one is uh, Profit Protector Pro and we've got some other things in the in the works, Sumfully, which is just in beta, and you might have heard of online arbitrage deals.com. That's from my uh, business partner. We service help build software tools and stuff for Amazon sellers doing the online arbitrage and retail arbitrage business model. I missed one. Buybot Go, the new retail arbitrage app that comes free with Buybot Pro 2. So that's where I'm at. So heavily invested in this space, been a part of the community for a long time, taught thousands of people how to do it. And here I am speaking to you. <laughs> Fantastic. And hey, it's, uh, my God, I think, you know, I, you've, been, you've been in this game for years. And obviously you said you started in Amazon quite a while ago. I mean, I started like four years ago. You were, you, 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 you're obviously- I don't know, it might be six, seven years. I don't know how long it's been now. You obviously created Secret Wealth Project, which is yeah. uh, all about entrepreneurs and online as she say businesses but it, a lot of that was always around the amazon so when i joined it's the amazon space. yeah so i set up secret wealth project to help people do what i'd done which is come from nothing i used to be a bin man and make a bunch of money on the on, online it was never meant to be about amazon but that was a nice beginning starting point to kind of start talking about an easy beginner friendly business model and then it ended up being very much focused on online arbitrage so that's the thread we've pulled on that's the rabbit hole we've gone down and that's what brings me to you today i guess <laughs> well thank you honestly and I, I think you know from my side is i got into this whole game yeah because i joined secret world projects you know i joined that group and you oh. know, i learned you and that's i think you know I was, I was in the kind of game but the first kind of introduction to the community i ever had around amazon was secret world projects. Oh, wow. so thank Look you no, i'm no, sure no, 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 there no, no, are no. many other sellers so I, I do hear that quite a lot, a lot actually but yeah so quick let's just clarify because what i want to do is just make sure we understand your background so you've been doing internet marketing online marketing for yeah. 20 years i think you said uh, over 20 years now yeah yeah, yeah, I've been saying 20 years for a few years. I mean, like, it's about 20 years, but it really is over 20 years now. And how long in the Amazon space? You know, how long ago did you think, did you first find out, let's consider a look at arbitrage? Space? Yeah, I, I don't know exactly when I started in the arbitrage space. The last couple of years, a bit of a blur. So, like, I don't even know, but I'm guessing five years ago six years ago maybe i got into oa a little bit private label i got into that a little bit before that so a year or two before but it's only guesswork i don't know off the top of my head but it's been some time now um, and if i'm right obviously I, I still remember the pictures of you getting lots of products shipped to the house you know you if i'm right I'm thinking you're not a seller anymore but you were a seller. Yes. you've been through the whole journey yeah shipping all the products to your house yeah. lego during q4 christmas madness yeah, yeah 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 we've done we've prepped like i always say to my partner holly like we i've prepped 50 grand's worth of stock in a month or something like that and she says no you didn't i did but it's like it's not true i did loads of prepping so that you'll, you, you, like there is photos of massive piles of boxes and stuff. The usual, what I always have in my garage and in, in my house, in my kitchen, everywhere. Any, anybody that does OA at any kind of scale will know that you end up getting piles of boxes unless you use a prep center or a warehouse or something like that. Or unless you prep them really quick and keep them going into Amazon. But yeah, we massive mountains of, of products. First of all, let's just talk about where has arbitrage come from? So tell me about that journey of like, what's gone on in the arbitrage field? How was it when you started right up until today? Give me a bit of a history okay. of like what's, what you've seen. So obviously I know sellers that were in it long before me. So as much as I'm going to act like I'm, I've been there in it forever, I've not. But when I first got into it, sourcing products 
at 50% plus ROI was almost a given. You just did it and, and everybody focused on selling out within 30 days. And I know some sellers still talk about 30 days and 50% ROI now, but at least in vanilla arbitrage, I think that's a little bit of a pipe dream for many. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I, I have seen people that are doing really well and doing like 78% ROI, 98% ROI. There are, they are out there, but I think in reality, as soon as you get to a certain point whereby you're pushing volume, I'm not talking about cherry picking the very best deal and making a few hundred a month. I'm talking about when you when you push in some volume, you almost have to accept that your average ROI is going to come down. But when I first started, I would say that people definitely aimed for between 35 and 50% ROI, and that was a given. And, and you typically wouldn't source any less than that. Now, I would still say, especially to beginners, focus on, on deals that are 30, 35% plus ROI for sure. But the reality is over time what's happened is competition and big sellers trying to get volume and things like that i've competed with each other on the only lever that oa really has and its price um i mean it's not the only lever like i say you can get algorithmic with your repricing and things like that but basically the, it, it's come down to where, whereby people are sourced at 20 percent 25 percent 30 percent roi on a regular basis and i think that's just the evolution of every market just it just happens like it, it can't stay 50 percent or 100 percent. it's just not reality if you, even private label if you're in a relatively competitive space you're not going to be getting the 300% ROIs that they promise on, on the courses or the, even the 100% ROIs. It's, it, it's a slim margin game, but it's a numbers game. And the old adage, it's a marathon, not a sprint and all that stuff. But what I've seen is margins have come down. Obviously, competition's increased. Now, more so than ever, it's a bit of a minefield. And I'm not trying to put anyone off. Let me caveat this in a minute. It's a bit of a minefield because there's brand restrictions, category restrictions, there's IB, IP issues. There's, there's a whole load of red flags that can catch a brand new seller out. And one or two of those red flags can just end their Amazon dream overnight. When I was started, starting, there was less of that. So there was less hoops to jump through with Amazon. There was stronger margins and all that stuff, but it wasn't without its problems. The beauty of it is you didn't have the tools back then to overcome these problems, but now you do have the tools. So like these red flags that I talk about can be over, overcome with one click and shameless plug, Buybot Pro, one click, overcomes all of the red flags. So if you're worried about starting to sell on Amazon and what I've just said would put you off, I would say that no, because five years ago, you didn't have all the profit analytics tools like Sunflare, you didn't have the, the analysis tools like Buybot Pro. You didn't have the tools back then that would make this business easy to run. As far as I'm concerned now, trying to do OA with no tools is crazy, yeah. impossible, stupid. Like. Some people are so proud to like say, well, I've never spent a penny on any tool. Well, you're not very smart if you don't because you're wasting time, you're gonna get bad buys, you're gonna hit these red flags, these minefields, these landmines as I call them. More software, more tools, more services, your outsourcing service, like all that stuff has actually made it easier in a much more difficult environment. The environment from your average OA has got more difficult over the years, but the tools have almost compensated so much for that. You can now have a multi-million pound business like you, having other people run it, using these tools, using VAs, and it's like nobody did that back then and like scaling to the point whereby you've scaled it to never mind I mean there's other sellers just like you but like scaling to that point was almost felt a little bit impossible for OA back then whereas now it's it's not commonplace it's still a massive achievement but you hear of it more than you did then so there was no tools ROIs were stronger and stuff but then arguably again sales have increased on Amazon each year the sales take off exponentially so it's like each year is more sells more than the last so it's like yes it's got harder to sell but at the same time things things have changed to make it easier tools software services Services, increase Amazon sales and things like that. So it's like every year since I started, somebody out there said OA is dead. OA is dead. Every single year. Every year, OA is dead. And every year, the community, bless them, they're so amazing. They find innovative solutions for the new hoops and hurdles that Amazon puts in the way or the market puts in the way. You know, so so for example, when when I first got into it, every seller started on toys. And now sellers tend to try at least pretty quickly getting into groceries or, or beauty or something else. So what you're able to sell has changed massively. 
The tools that enable you to sell it have changed massively. There's a lot more support and services and courses and stuff and free information out there than there ever was. So actually, for, as far as the evolution of OA goes, it's matured a lot. It's matured in a, a great many ways and it's, it's in a better space than where it was when I started. And that sounds crazy having set, like just said what I've said, but it's, it's better than where it was. Does that make sense? I, did does, I waffle a bit? There is a lot in there. Yeah. There's a lot in there. Yeah. I just want to kind of break it down. Okay. If anyone is like, you know, a lot of people are going to be watching this are going to be, should we say, starting out, thinking yeah. about starting on Amazon. First things first, question, one thing you kind of talked about there was something called vanilla arbitrage. Yeah. What is that? I, I'm, I don't want to say I coined the term, but I believe I coined the term. And I, I know Natalie Cromie has, as many times, credited me with coining the term vanilla arbitrage. But basically, it's your standard OA. It's not unique bundling. It's not wholesaling or getting creative with, with your model or your sourcing methods. It's just buying low from a normal store like Argos, Tesco, Asda, or Best Buy Target, and selling for high on Amazon. That's all it is. It's buy low, sell high. Without any steps in between, without anything weird, it's just that. That's, that's what I see a vanilla arbitrage as. And the funny thing is, is you know, that's pretty much what I do all that's, the time. Yeah, so that's what you we, do. We were talking yeah. about this, it's really yeah. interesting. It's like, I just do the really boring vanilla arbitrage. Yeah. So, okay, so vanilla arbitrage. So that's the really simple stuff. We're not talking about complex, you know, like, should we say creating your own listings, bundles, you know, like really going kind of like to town or doing really unique sourcing methodology yeah. and stuff. It's like, found something, yeah. Yeah, sell it, simple. Yeah. Yeah. You know, generally, it's easier than simple. Yeah. Generally what everyone starts with. But also as well, I think what you're saying is in that vanilla arbitrage, because it is so simple, because of the increased education, yeah. because of the increase in tools, yeah. Um, because in, you know, my God, the number of people, in like, you know, YouTube videos, me, yourself, lots of people, then what we're seeing is that more and more people are starting. So there is, should we say, there are more sellers yeah. on it. And there could be, you know, in the vanilla space, there could be perceived to be more competition. Yeah. And the net result of that is, and you talked about it earlier on, when you first started ROIs, 35 to 50% very commonplace. Yes, new sellers should now be focusing on that, but what we're seeing is the more volume you do, you're actually now having to deviate from that. And in my business, I certainly see that as well. Yeah. My God, if I turn around and get a 50% ROI you know, in <laughs> a day, I'm, I'm <laughs> the happiest man alive. We're not yeah. going anywhere near that. But yeah. it, does, it does obviously show where it's been and where it's going. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Like now, you, one click, one click, vanilla arbitrage, just one click with some software that's it you can go right okay that's 37 percent roi i'll source it or, or it's 25 percent roi i won't you know just one click that's how easy it is okay so you've told me a little bit about what vanilla arbitrage is but you mentioned some other things in there if anyone doesn't know red flags these things sound dangerous what what are these red flags to okay about? the red flags are what would stop a normal seller selling if they didn't have a tool and that's because for example, if there's a brand restriction and you're not using a tool, you don't know about it. So that alone, you go buy a load of Apple AirPods and then go try and sell them on Amazon because you thought, oh, they're a bargain, I'm gonna make a fortune. And it's like, maybe, maybe you pick them up for 120 quid and you think they're going for 240 and you're gonna make a fortune. No, you're not, you're not gonna be able to sell them. They just won't be able to. So it's little things like that. Now there's some subtle red flags like Am or Amazon selling on it. So some people go, if Amazon is selling on it, I won't sell it. I think that's short sighted. I don't think that's, I've never thought that that's something you should worry about. Yeah, it, it's a red flag, as in maybe if Amazon's selling on it, you wanna see some evidence that there's been other sellers, and you can tell that from like the BuyBot Pro uh, new offer count charts and stuff. If sellers are selling out, and, and that's been happening over time, you'll be able to see that in the charts, and then obviously you know that, oh yeah, Amazon actually do share the buy box because this new offer count won't be going eight, nine, 10, nine, eight, seven. It wouldn't be doing that. That first one, so if I'm right, that other people might call that like gated, gated restrictions. Yeah, yeah. The one, the Amazon selling. Yes, yeah. The listing. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's a subtle red flags and then there's the like game changing end of like end of days red flags. So what's that? Uh, what what the, the bad ones? Yeah. Tell well, me. what is most, mostly for, for a new seller, it's can you sell it? Am I eligible to sell it? So, and that encompasses a bunch of different things, but things like an intellectual property check, just check that it's not 
likely to be private label that somebody's got brand registered and they're going to attack you or something like that and cause trouble for you if it's a brand category or product restriction and again i don't want to go and bang on about barbot bar pro too much but, mm. but but like one click auto on gate and i know there's a manual way to do that through seller central but barbot bar pro makes it easy you click auto on gate and i've been making some videos recently and i've, I've been pressing this auto on gate button on on listings expecting nine out of ten times for it to say no rejected and the vast majority of the times maybe it's because i've got an old mature account the vast majority of times it auto on gated me with one click so as a new seller if you weren't even aware of that then you could you could be restricted or you might not know that you can get auto ungated there's just red flags that would stop you from making any money and getting a bad what i call a bad buy so another red flag might be price spike on a, on a sales chart so whether you're using keeper or using buy pro there's the sales charts and if you're a beginner you might look at the current price if you can't see the sales charts you might look at the current price and source a product because it's like i don't know it looks amazing but in fact the price spiked upwards because there was only one seller left on the listing and maybe they repriced and maxed it out or maybe they just thought i'm going to make some money here and they put the price up but whatever the reason was it was a price spike so you source it thinking that that's the price it's going to stay and without looking at the sales charts or having a tool to help you you would never know that so that's it's like there's mild red flags and there's big red flags but but software just removes pretty much 99 percent of them and common sense re removes the one percent and i know also you have um like shipping eligible for fba but there's one thing which i want to just touch on there ip complaints yeah you know red flags and this is a you know, brand checking this is a big thing and and you know it's, it's a really interesting one because you might be eligible to sell it you might have fba is okay and you're like cool no problems um and you can even get it where you know sometimes it's like there are other FBA sellers on there. And you're like, okay, cool, I think I've done my due diligence. Yep. And you chip it in and then bang, you get that IP complaint. And IP complaints, you know, for new sellers are, is something you really, you know, all sellers need to take seriously, but especially for new sellers, because you, you know, it's about, you've got problems with intellectual property, with certain brands. The question I really want to ask around IP complaints, and I, I know in one of the services you provide, it's called getunsuspended.com, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And obviously you help people with these IP complaints. Yeah. So the question which I want to ask is five years ago, what were the IP complaints and what are the dangers like for them then? And what are they like today? Has it changed? Yeah, I mean, I feel like when I was doing OA, you'd get the occasional difficult person message you some snotty thing and say, oh, you've, you're, you shouldn't you should be selling this or where have you sourced these products from? I remember I bought these, they were black cocktail jug things like you know, fishbowl. Can you remember fishbowl cocktails? Oh, they yeah. were black Halloween fishbowl cocktails. And I bought a load that were on sale, boxes full. And I put them on Amazon and then the people that sold them to me didn't like the fact that I was selling them on the listing. But all I did is sent them a message back saying, you sold me these products, here's my uh, receipt or invoice or whatever. And that, they just went away. Maybe somebody watching this that's been doing this forever, like John Stevenson has been doing it forever. Maybe he'll go, no, it was a bit lumpy back then, but it didn't feel like there was that many issues back then. It wasn't like that. Like I say, you'd get the odd snotty message and, and minor issues, but but now it, it, it's almost like if you're selling long enough on Amazon, you almost expect to get suspended. Okay. So, so, so like, and that's not the case. That's just a perception. I think every Amazon seller does live in fear a little bit of what happens if I get suspended. And that's not something to be fearful of. It's not something to run away from. It's something to embrace and accept as part of the platform. But like you mentioned earlier, I get unsuspended and more so suspension safeguard was created to combat that so my business partner Karen she is one of if not the country's best experts in suspensions and as a team we deal with like we deal with suspensions all day long every day I mean just for up-to-date information currently very few suspensions are happening on Amazon we're getting very few suspensions we're getting a lot of weird emails that might need somebody to have a look at. We look at them as part of the service for free, not a problem and give any advice on them. But actual suspensions are quite down at the minute, which is which is good news. But there has been times where suspensions can spike. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it's something every seller lives in fear of. 
but it is part of the platform. You're playing on Amazon's playground, they make the rules. Oftentimes they can make what I consider to be a bit of a poor decision, but oftentimes it's because a seller misunderstood something or it's not like they deserve to get booted. I'll be the first one to say, look, if you're selling counterfeit goods from blooming wherever and you're trying to pass them off as proper goods, you should be suspended. Amazon should never let you sell on their platform again. But if you just, if you did some procedural thing that led to you getting suspended, like for example, I don't know, when when Amazon email you about something and then you email them back and then you do that a few times, oftentimes it can be seen as an appeal and then it appeals so many times, I don't know if it's still like this, but it appeals so many times and they can suspend you. That that feels wrong if you've done nothing wrong. I, what I take away from that, and I, and I, I really agree and I, I really understand is you, it's something interesting you said, we are seeing the number of suspensions is going down. Yes. And, and hey, this is like, you know, I've been in the game now for like four years. I always do that, like, hey, I've been in the game for four years. When I first started, I don't know the number of suspensions, but what I will say is that Amazon were very, you know, the whole policy I thought Amazon would have was suspend first, ask questions later. Yeah. Whereas now they seem to be a lot more kind of ask a lot of questions, give a lot of warnings up front, and then suspensions come. Suspensions were you know out of the blue were quite common three four years ago. Yeah. Now I personally don't see that as maybe, much. Maybe thing. that's it. Maybe that's what's changing. Yeah, I mean there is still suspensions. People course, do get yeah. suspended, and and it, sometimes it, it, if you if they're to be believed, let, and they've not done anything wrong, it does sometimes feel unfair. But and again, I don't work in that, so I'm not really an expert on it. But I do. I have a weekly meeting with the team that literally deals with suspensions and all that kind of stuff all day long and they're telling me there's less suspensions so maybe that's what's happening maybe that maybe Amazon are finally listening and not shooting first and never asking questions maybe they are maybe they're doing it the right way around now I don't, I don't know maybe that's that explains it maybe and even because maybe there's more scrutiny on them from you know, the, you know I think the Congress and the US have you know there's a lot of questions around and yeah. how ethical their practices are yeah so uh, one other thing which I'll just kind of touch upon before we move on to the future yeah. just in the past is you mentioned uh, you know around gating being gated brands you can't sell one thing that I'm hearing a lot of and you know I'm seeing is brands which you could sell in the past so like five years ago me and you could sell something now all of a sudden they're becoming gated yeah is that something that you see uh, yeah of course of course I mean that's that's happened since day one it's it, you know one minute you can sell something the next minute you can't that is another one of those things whereby if you're not using a tool, you now can't stay on top of it. And, and again, I don't, I don't mean to bang on about it, but Bybot Pro, through its partnership with Get On Suspended and Suspension Safeguard, we feed back the data into Bybot Pro in real time. So if we learn about a suspension and we double check, we don't just go, oh, someone says this. If we learn about suspension, we learn about it same day because somebody scared their Amazons, you know, maybe even same hour, same minute, their Amazon accounts are suspended. As soon as we hear about that, that data goes into Bybot Pro and it comes part of your one-click analysis so that I'd like to think we've got, if I'm pretty certain, but there's no way of proving it, we've got one of, if not the most comprehensive brand gating databases and product gating databases in the world. And it's baked into Barbot Pro. I keep thinking, like, I don't really don't want to be selling and I'm not trying to sell. It's not, I sound like Robert <laughs> Kiyosaki when he's asked questions. But everything links back to that stuff because oh. like, it, it, it fixes problems. That's cool. Hey, the well. landmines of Amazon are now fixed with that one-click anal analysis yeah. button. You know, they just are. I wouldn't want to do OA without it. Oh, I, I hey, really I, wouldn't, or something like it. No, I really understand. So, think you know, I think that's really interesting. Yep. I think if, if I summarise yep. what we've seen in the past over the last couple of years, um, and feel free to add to it, and then we'll move on to the future yep. of what we think. So, first things first, selling on Amazon has become easier. Yep. Why? YouTube channels like yours and mine. My God, you've been pump, you know you've been releasing YouTube videos for years. You're not doing it so much active anymore, but you've got like never mind the buy box talking about what's going on in the Amazon you know, ecosystem. Um, so more content is out there. Also more course providers, more people sharing information, more people are sharing how to do it and systematizing it, and making it easier. Yeah, you know, and in addition to that, software services, yeah. lots of things to make it easier. Yeah. The net result of that is there are an increase in number of Amazon sellers. We've yeah. seen an increase in number of Amazon sellers. We've also seen that because of an increase in number of Amazon sellers, for what we classify as vanilla arbitrage, yeah. we've seen a reduction in the typical ROI that most sellers would be achieving. Yeah. We talked about 35 to 50% initially, now coming down. You know, I've done some videos recently, I talked about changing from 
30 down to 20 percent roi yeah. when i do my sourcing admittedly i'm probably bigger than most it's, it's the volume yeah, yeah it's yeah. a volume game and that has an impact i think also as well the other thing which you kind of highlight is there are issues around products being gated that were previously ungated now they are gated um, what we are seeing is brands do have you know even if you can sell it it's fba able there are brands which you can get ip complaints from but what we are seeing now is suspensions are less are happening less we're not saying this is a statistical fact this is just a feeling yeah um, we're seeing that um, and also the services that help and Amazon are kind of asking first rather than suspending first and then asking questions. Seems, later. seems that way, yeah. So that's an interesting thing. But in all of this, it's painting a bit, you know, a bad picture in the fact that it's more competitive, less profit to be made. But it is easier to start with great tools and great education. But also as well, it seems safer. Amazon aren't suspending so much. But the opportunity is being decreased, increased competition, increased gating. But the one thing we are kind of missing from it is Amazon's revenue is growing up and up. And third party sales, I know from looking at some stats, are probably about over 50% of all Amazon's revenue. So I mean, third party sellers like you were and I am now, we represent half of Amazon sales, which is incredible. And, you know, I haven't really talked about it, but you could watch a lot of videos on like Amazon's congressional hearing into how they operate third party sales and should they be split up and long story, you know, we could be here forever talking about that. Yeah. But, I think the, the thing which I summarise is you know, what I'm seeing is it's becoming easier. There are more restrictions, but the marketplace is still growing. Now, let me ask you, kind of understand, does that sound about right with what we've seen in the it past? It sounds like you recorded me with a photographic <laughs> memory and we ba you basically just summarised it perfectly. Perfect. So that's understanding where we've been and where we are today. Yeah. You know, I think the question everyone's asking right now, is Amazon arbitrage dead? Is it going to be dead in 2022? What do you think? Oh, no, no. Anybody that's a uh, surprise, a surprise, people are still asking the same old question they've been asking every year since I started, is Amazon debt? Is, is arbitrage debt? No, 100% not. Is there a potential that Amazon could one day say, we're not gonna allow any third party resellers to do what they're doing or something? I mean, there's always a risk, but you've got to deal with what, what's in front of you and what's ahead of you, not speculate what might be or what might not be. And the reality is third party sellers and resellers form a huge part of Amazon's business. And a huge part of Amazon's success is because of those sellers. Personally, we wouldn't be investing as much money and time and effort as we are into creating new tools and better tools for online arbitragers if we thought in 2022, it's gonna go back. Like I say, people have been saying it for years what ha actually happens is the sellers get more innovative the tools get better the services get better uh, the education gets better everything levels up and then amazon sales are increasing literally exponentially when you look at the chart it's not linear it's not like us it's not how we grow normal businesses like that it does this like it's crazy so yeah more sellers but you can capture more of the hugely increasing ever increasing amazon sales i've been ordering loads of Money, loads of money, loads of stuff off Amazon just this last couple of weeks. I never did that before. I've even got a Prime account now. That's a, that's a first. So it's like, I'm, I'm getting it. I understand Amazon now. I understand why people are obsessed with it. I bought some fake thing off eBay. Second thing I bought off eBay that was fake. And, and Ollie was like, look, if you just buy off Amazon, you won't get that problem. And it's like, with the Prime and I don't know, it's, it's a very compelling proposition for buyers. And as a seller, you can really capitalize on the fact that Amazon's such a great platform. Uh, it's just exploding in growth but no it's not going to be dead we won't be investing what we're investing we're creating new tools and stuff we wouldn't be doing that if we didn't think there was a future in OA if you go to 10 years from now will OA be the same as it is now no will there be some form of reselling on Amazon probably almost certainly will there be some form of arbitrage opportunities online even if it's not on Amazon certainly 100%. So let's say, I don't know, something crazy happens and somebody starts competing with Amazon and doing well, or well maybe there'll be an opportunity arise on that platform. You know, as far as I'm concerned, for the next five years, arbitrage will evolve. It has done over the last five years, but for the next five years, it's not going anywhere. I wouldn't spend another penny on software if I thought it was, it was done. 
It's not done, it's growing, the market's growing, the opportunities are growing, Amazon's huge, it's getting bigger and better. 2022 is gonna be a storm in the year for those that double down on it. I think we are moving into a period of where the economy is gonna fall over. I think that, I don't wanna scaremonger or anything, but I think there's gonna be a lot of hardship and pain coming up, but I don't think that's necessarily gonna be a bad thing for Amazon or Amazon sellers. I actually think that's probably gonna help Amazon sellers weirdly in some weird inverse way. 2022, 100%, it's just gonna, it's, it, arbitrage is gonna be, continue to be the beast it is now. 2023, 2024, 2025, I just think it's gonna keep going. 10 years from now, who knows? Some form of it, but an evolved form, no doubt. Oh my God, interesting. You talked about there, it's gonna change, there's gonna be challenges, and the economy's gonna have challenges. My yeah. God, we always, you know, boom and bust is, is the very nature of what we do, it's happened since. Yeah. You know, a long, long time. But interesting enough, COVID, you know, while a big problem for a lot of the economy, actually really helped e-commerce massively huge, change the huge. world. Huge, and, th and this is the point. We're not likely to see, at least over the next couple of years, we're not likely to see things go back to the way they were. They're more likely to go more down this route, which means people like Amazon sellers are likely to benefit from it. Personal feelings about the economy and stuff aside, arbitrage, especially for the next few years, is here to stay, going from strength to strength it will change it will evolve the strong sellers will adapt and get bigger and better the people that are too scared of change or or don't like the odd red flag or having to click analyze in some software that will disappear hey it's really interesting and i think you talked about it there like there's going to be change there's going to be hardship that's you know that's I completely agree is arbitrage going to be the same no you are going to have to adapt and my god it is it, not the same as it is today than exactly. it was you know and if don't get me wrong you of course you can still do vanilla arbitrage in five years but if you look at where the margin's going you're not going to be making good money but, um, but what you've got to remember is vanilla margin uh, arbitrage will get to a point whereby there is no more to shave off it yeah it's like a game of chicken. You know, like kids play chicken. Who's who's willing to get the closest to getting run over, which is ridiculous, but it, it, it's kind of like that. Who's willing to get the closest to making zero money? And I think that there will be a point whereby people go, no, I'm not doing it for any less. And what usually happens is those people that get overly aggressive with the prices get shaken out of the tree. Mm -hmm. They're the low hanging fruit that disappears super quick. And it might take them a year, might take them two years, might take them a VAT bill, whatever. But, but eventually they get shaken out and they go, get rid of if you look at big retail uh like big retailers like supermarkets and stuff their margins that they run on three percent oh walmart's one i think yeah it's, it's like tiny tiny so so when we're moaning about oh it's only 20 percent, it's only 25 percent. you've got to be realistic if you're getting 20 percent on those kind of sales from buying from everyday stores you know online like that's unreal that's amazing so what? It's not 50%. So what? But it's not going to go to 1%, 2%, 3% because normal people won't do it. So I do think there's a floor level. I think it's important to scale as quick as you can. And you want to be one of the bigger sellers, not the smaller sellers if you're going to stick to vanilla. But there's all those other little opportunities that arise from arbitrage. So you start off doing vanilla and then you do maybe ha add a little bit of wholesale. You do add a little bit of retail arbitrage. You do add a bit of bundling. And all of a sudden you go, you go from having this competitive margin online arbitrage business so actually that becomes your cornerstone or your bedrocky business and you you add other revenue opportunities on top i think we'll see lots of that and yeah hey, i think it's interesting and you, you talked about it earlier arbitrage we say, you know, I always talk about this. Arbitrage is just trade. Buy low, sell yeah. high. It's it's the oldest game in the book. It was, you know, it's like back in before money was invented. It was like get a sheep, ship it somewhere else, and sell it for like yeah, you know, give them like two, I don't know, bits of gold. Or I don't know, yeah. give them two or something, and then you get three <laughs> when you ship it somewhere else. Yeah. Buy low, sell yeah. high, and that's what you're doing. Um, and the interesting thing is, I, I do like it in the fact that it's not going to go away. It will evolve. It will go into different forms. And I really like the fact that you said. And, and I like the fact that you highlighted it as well, is the fact that Amazon's come along to be this big beast. There might be another beast which comes along and does it really well, and that's another opportunity. Yeah. And, and I think the one thing we really see in Amazon now is, you know, when you look at Amazon's portfolio of products, the high volume, super good products, they are Amazon on the listings. Yeah. But all the other ones, which maybe aren't as high volume, but still, my God, you make good money. A lot of them are being sold by the third party sellers. How much? 
Well, by Amazon's own admission, more than half of its revenue is from third party sellers. So that's incredible. And I think the fact that comes is, is to say, well, if you were to get rid of all those third party sellers, Amazon's gonna lose half its revenue. Yeah. You know, that's massive. And, and let's say for example, they had to, Congressional Congress or something, something yeah. came up. Someone else is gonna look at it and be like, there is an opportunity here for yeah. half of Amazon's revenue tomorrow. Yeah. Like, so, uh, you know, listening to what you're saying, margins are going to decrease, it's getting more competitive. Yes, I don't, don't deny that, but you need to evolve. You need to become more, you know, thinking about doing different ways of doing the model, you know, using software, using services, scaling up. You don't say small, go big. You know, there's going to be economies, there's going to be economies of scale, but also as well, evolving that model and also looking for other opportunities when they arise. Yeah. You know, uh, there are a lot of other platforms right now. I know people say on like Walmart, people say on eBay, doing other distributions. Yeah. But that can help out. But at the end of the day, if you do what is always done, you get what it's just going to be too much competition. But the market is still going to be there. Yeah, yeah. And there are worries, there are IP complaints, there are gatings, but there's a lot of great tools and services around like now, like Bybot Pro, like you're talking about, Safeguard Suspension, I think you talked about. S uh, suspension Safeguard. So going to yeah. Suspension Safeguard yeah. that help you in that, that yeah. process. Yeah. Um, to the point whereby you don't even need to worry about them anymore. Good. Like, is it meltable? Is it dangerous goods? Is it all these things? There's just one click in a software tool yeah. now, and there wasn't before. But what? what that's not, lowered the barrier to entry. Oh, it lowered, lowered the barrier to entry. And, and really, Really expanding on that lowered barrier to entry, what I really like about Arbitrage is that I've done, you name it, I've done it. Philip Martin, everything, you name it, I've done it. Online, money making things. And I've seen other people try to do those same business models I've done. And which, whatever they are, the failure rate in those other business models is extremely high extremely high maybe they don't have the skill set to make it work maybe they don't have the capital to make it work maybe they don't have the inclination or the tenaciousness if that's a word to make it work maybe they just don't stick it out long enough maybe they don't know when to pivot i don't know but other business models for beginners at least for your everyday normal person that's got a job got a family just your normal people they are failure rate high super high arbitrage is not you come into arbitrage the success rate is super high now, how you define success is up to you. Now, if you want, if you don't want to touch a business that's going to make you less than a million a year, and that's how you define success, then then you're not going to be successful in OA, at least not for a long time, and probably tweaking and pivoting and doing all kinds of bits. But if maybe your success is I want enough to be able to afford a, a car payment, so I want to get that car I've always wanted, or a house payment, so I want to get that house, or you want to take the kids on holiday. If that defines your level of success, well, then doing online arbitrage is a no-brainer because there's not much easier out there. All those other business models that I've done littered with failures of, of, of other people where they've just not made it work. Some do, most don't. Oh, hey, the only way you really fail, and again, I'm not promising anything, but the only way you really fail is not doing it and, and not doing some basic training. You, you go through a basic course, free stuff on YouTube, just a free course. You go through that, you, you get to the end, just do it and you'll make money. Maybe you break even for a while you, while you're figuring it out, but do it and you'll make money. Those things, you can't say that. There's basically one lever in our way, buying at the right price. That's it. And then choosing when to sell and at what price. So it's just price, it's a price game. Buy low, sell high. Don't get no easier, easier than that. Amazon do all the shipping, picking, packing, selling. It's their customers. The demand's already there. You only buy it if the demand's already there. So ultimately, as long as you use decent training and a decent software tool or two, anybody can make OA work. Anybody. Yeah. Like your grandma, your next door neighbor's kid, literally anybody can make OA work. And that's what I really, really like about it. Fantastic. No, I really agree. And I think, you know, that's, that's for me one reason why it really appealed, it appealed to me. The barrier to entry is so low and also the starting capital is very low. Yeah. Question for you, you know, I appreciate you're a busy man. You've got a lot going on, a lot in development, a lot of secret projects, obviously, that are excited. There's having... one I didn't mention earlier to you, actually. So there's a lot yeah. of other things. Yeah. And obviously, you've got a lot you're working on right now, a lot of software products as well. So if anyone wants to find out more about you, get in contact, how can they reach out? And what's the best way to be like in your community? What would you recommend? Okay, you so so obviously, purchase one of our software tools, if you like, Buybot Pro, Profit Protector Pro. 
Sunfully being the flagship one, Sunfully's in beta, or Bybot Go, but that's part of Bybot Pro, or get suspension safeguard. But with regards to communities, we've got a free Facebook group at Bybot, Bybot Pro. If you tap in Bybot Pro, don't join the page, join the group on Facebook. You can you can see us there. Same with Profit Protector Pro, there's a free Facebook group there. So I'm oftentimes hanging around in there somewhere. We, I am doing some of the stuff. I'm creating some free training, but that's not out yet, probably depending on when you make this video. Or maybe it is, I don't know, when, whenever you put this video out. But yeah, that's probably the best way. Okay, guys, um, what I will say is I'll just drop a link down below to all of those you know, software tools and groups that Matt talked about. So if you're interested, have a look in the description. That'll be down below. Matt, can I just say thank you so much for, oh my God, taking the time and talking to us. Obviously, uh, what an amazing history you've got, obviously you've done, and obviously, you know, well done for you know, the journey you've gone through so far and also obviously the software that you've brought to the community. You know, like I said, you know, the majority of our VA Academy users are using Bible Pro and it's definitely a great bit of software. So, thank you. you know, thank you so much. So I just want to say for myself and obviously anyone watching, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for obviously adding value and sharing of your knowledge, skills and experience in this video today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate it. It's been good. Cheers.